Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. If you are new here then my name is Miss Estrick and I've been teaching and tutoring for over 14 years. Oh my gosh yes it is that long and I cannot believe it either but I am here to help you to improve your biology knowledge, study skills and exam technique and in this video I'm going through all of the theory for AS paper 2 for exams 2022. So I've had a look at the AQA advanced information list and all of the theory is included within this video. So get yourself settled in, grab yourself a drink and this will be your main revision booster. Now if you're using this just to help you understand the information then that is perfect. But to help you to remember all the information I recommend trying out my active recall workbook which is specifically designed to help you improve your memory of all the information by testing your knowledge in a range of different ways and it covers all of the AS or the A-level content depending which booklet you go for. It also has all of the answers so you can get an idea of what the key marking points are for each topic. But for now, Let's get into paper two. So some of the key terms linked to the gas exchange and ventilation topic that you need to be familiar with are breathing. So this is the movement of air in and out of the lungs. This is different to respiration because respiration is a chemical reaction that results in the release of energy in the form of ATP. Ventilation is the scientific term for breathing. So we'll be using the term ventilate quite a lot in this video. And gas exchange is the diffusion of typically oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of cells. Now, it's not just the alveoli, that is just for mammals. So those are the key terms just to be familiar with. And these are the key structures that you need to know for the human gas exchange system. So the alveoli, bronchioles, bronchi, trachea and lungs, which are all labelled here. So if you need to pause just to note that down, then pause that just here. So if we have a look at how humans ventilate. It involves the muscle, which is the diaphragm. It also involves antagonistic muscles, which are surrounding the ribs. And this is where we have the external intercostal muscles, but we also have internal intercostal muscles. Now antagonistic means that as one muscle is contracting the other relaxes and we'll see that in our intercostal muscles how the internal and external will always be doing the opposite and that is what controls the movement of the rib cage in and out um, to help with ventilation. So a bit more about these internal and external intercostal muscles. Antagonistic muscles always occur as pairs and the external intercostal muscle on the outside layer of the ribs, and they will contract and cause the rib cage to move out and air to flow in, or inspiration. The internal intercostal muscles, um, you can kind of see as it moves around 3D, they'll be on the inside layer um, around the ribs. And when these ones contract, that will pull the rib cage closer inwards and therefore the air will flow out or you'll be expiring. But just to have a summary then of what is happening to all of the muscles that are controlling the movement of the rib cage and therefore whether you're inhaling or exhaling or inspiring or expiring. So when you are breathing in, that is when your external intercostal muscles will be contracting and that pulls the rib cage up and outwards. That means that the internal intercostal muscles are doing the opposite, they're relaxing. The diaphragm muscle contracts, and when that contracts, it causes it to move downwards and it becomes more flat. Now, as a result, that means that the volume of the thorax will be larger, so the volume increases. And by that, we don't mean the volume of gases, we mean the volume as in the cavity space, so the available volume, the actual um, space available. And because the lung volume, the thorax space is larger, that causes the pressure to drop. And because you now have a lower pressure within the lungs compared to outside, air is going to flow in. So that is what happens when you breathe in. Now, when you exhale, it's exactly the opposite. So this time the external intercostal muscles relax, the internal will contract and that pulls the rib cage down and back in. The diaphragm relaxes which causes it to dome upwards 
And as a result, the actual volume in the thorax, that space, is smaller. And because we have a smaller space or a smaller volume, that causes the pressure to increase. And that is why the air is forced out of the lungs. Now, the pulmonary ventilation calculation is one that you do need to know. And it's the total volume of air that's moved into the lungs during one minute. And the units would be decimeters cubed for volume and per minute. So to work this out, you would be doing the tidal volume times the ventilation rate. So tidal volume is the volume, total volume of air. Um, and the ventilation rate is how many times you breathe per minute. So then if we go on to the gas exchange and look at the alveolar epithelium. Once the gases are in the alveoli, so as a result of ventilation, this is where gas exchange occurs, and it's between the epithelium and the blood. Alveoli are tiny air sacs, and you have around 300 million in each lung. And that's actually why lung tissue floats compared to, let's say, muscular heart tissue, which would sink. Um, so all of those alveoli air sacs make it float because it's so full of air. Now, the alveoli epithelium cells are also very, very thin. Um, and that is to minimize the diffusion distance. So we can see here there's just one layer of cells and they're a thin layer. Each alveolus is surrounded by a network of capillaries and this helps to maintain the concentration gradient because as soon as that oxygen diffuses into the blood, it is then carried away in the capillaries and replaced by deoxygenated blood. Terrestrial insects, they do have a large surface area to volume because they're small. However, the issue they have to overcome is the fact that they have a waterproof exoskeleton. And that's an advantage to prevent water loss, but because it's made up of this hard fibrous material, it also means gases can't exchange across it. Now, insects don't have lungs, but they do have a tracheal system, which is where ventilation and gas exchange occurs. So their tracheal system then, we have a look at how this differs to the human lungs. First of all, it includes a trachea, tracheoles and spiracles. The spiracles we can see here, they're the tiny holes, they're round valve-like openings that run along the abdomen. And this is where oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to be entering and leaving. So that is instead of like the nose or the mouth for humans. And those spiracles are going to be attached to trachea. So that's the next structure. And the trachea are tubes. They have rings within them to strengthen the tubes to stop them from collapsing. And that keeps the tubes permanently open. And then the trachea branch into smaller tubes, which are deeper in the abdomen of the insect. And those are called the tracheoles. And those extend throughout all of the tissue in the insect to deliver oxygen to all of the respiring cells. So here we have the spiracles connected to the trachea and then the tracheal systems branching all the way through um, into the center where the abdomen is and to all of the respiring tissues. Now there's three methods of moving gases into that tracheal system. The first method is gases can just move in by diffusion. And that is because when the cells within the insect are respiring, they're using up oxygen, producing carbon dioxide, and that creates a concentration gradient from the tracheals compared to the atmosphere. So some of the gases will simply diffuse in and out. The second method of gas exchange is mass transport. And this is where it's slightly similar to ventilation in humans in that the abdominal muscles can contract and relax. And that is a way to ventilate to move gases on mass in and out of the tracheal system. The final method is when the insects are in flight, the muscle cells will actually start to respire anaerobically. And when they do that, they produce lactate or lactic acid. And this lowers the water potential of the cells. And as a result, it draws water into the cells from the tracheals. That decreases the volume in the tracheals. And as a result, more air from the atmosphere is drawn in. So overall, the adaptations that terrestrial insects have for gas exchange are the fact that they have a large number of these fine tracheals providing a large surface area. The walls of the tracheals are very thin, 
and there's a short diffusion distance between the spiracles and the tracheoles, so that will speed up the rate of diffusion. And lastly, they use oxygen and they produce carbon dioxide, and that is how the steep concentration gradient is maintained. Now, the next challenge that the terrestrial insects have to overcome is limiting the amount of water that is lost at these gas exchange surfaces because a gas exchange surface is also ideal for evaporation and they do not want to be losing excess water. So here are the ways that water loss is prevented. Number one is the surface area where gas exchange actually happens is very small. So it's not the entire insect, we're just looking at the spiracle itself and then the tracheal system. That is a very small um, area compared to the whole volume of the insect and therefore it's going to limit evaporation. The rest of the insect has this waterproof exoskeleton and the spiracles can actually open and close a bit like stomata on a plant to reduce water loss also. So next is gas exchange in fish. Now fish are waterproof and they have a small surface area to volume ratio. So those are the two reasons why fish have to have a gas exchange surface with adaptations. And for fish, it's gills. Now fish obtain their oxygen from the water, but there is 30 times less oxygen dissolved in water than there is available in the atmosphere in the air. So they have to have an additional adaptation to help maintain the diffusion and concentration gradient across their gills. So just as a reminder, for all of these gas exchange surfaces, they have to have these three features. A large surface area compared to the volume, a short diffusion distance, and they have to have a mechanism to maintain the concentration gradient. Now those features can be used to work out the rate of diffusion using Fick's law. And this is just here. So diffusion is proportional to the surface area times the difference in concentration, divided by the length of diffusion pathway. So you could get questions linked to this testing that math skill. But let's have a look then at the fish gills to see how they have these three features maximized in their adaptations. So we're gonna have a look at the fish gill anatomy. So there are four layers of gills on both sides of the head and the gills are made up of stacks of gill filament. Each gill filament is covered in gill lamellae and these are positioned at right angles to the filament. So this here is the lamellae and this part is the filament. Now because there are so many that creates the large surface area. So that's the first adaptation ticked off because there's so many gill lamellae and gill filaments it creates that large surface area. Now when a fish opens its mouth while it is swimming water rushes in and then actually comes out the side of their head, which means that the water rushes over the gills. So the water enters here and then it goes over the gills on both sides of the head where they have these four layers of gills with the gill filaments and the gill lamellae. So the next thing is looking at the additional adaptations. We've talked about the large surface area to volume ratio, but the next thing is the fact that there is a short diffusion distance and that is because of the network of capillaries in every gill lamellae. So we're zooming in here on the gill lamellae and there is our network of capillaries within each one and that provides a short diffusion distance. How the concentration gradient is maintained is by something called the counter current flow mechanism. So the counter current flow mechanism is where water flows over the gills in the opposite direction to which the blood is flowing through the capillaries. The reason this is an advantage is it makes sure that the equilibrium of the concentration of oxygen is never reached. And because we don't have equilibrium being reached, that means that oxygen is able to continue diffusing from the water into the capillaries in the gill lamellae across the entire gill lamellae. And that's in bold and underlined because that is the key marking point. Now that's demonstrated in these two diagrams here where we look at concurrent flow in comparison to countercurrent flow. 
So in concurrent, not co-current, um, you'd have the water and the blood flowing in the same direction. So about halfway across the lamellae, you'd be reaching equilibrium and therefore you wouldn't have any more diffusion of gases. Whereas here we have the water and the blood flowing in opposite directions, which means you should never actually have equilibrium and there will always be a higher concentration of oxygen in the water compared to the blood. And that is why we maintain the concentration or the diffusion gradient across the entire gill lamellae. So lastly, it's looking at gas exchange in leaves. So you could be asked to look at some of the structures in the leaf. So we have the tissue layer palisade mesophyll, which is where photosynthesis mainly happens. And then we have the spongy mesophyll, where there's lots of air spaces. And we have the stomata, which is where the gases actually diffuse in and out of. So oxygen will actually diffuse out of the stomata if it's not being used in respiration. And carbon dioxide diffuses in because it's needed for photosynthesis. To reduce water loss by evaporation, stomata close at night when it's dark and they'll open in the daytime when it's bright. And this is linked to the idea of photosynthesis because it's a light dependent reaction. Now there are compromises though, and in particular linked to xerophytic plants, which are plants that are adapted to survive in environments with very limited water. So they have adaptations to minimise water loss because there's such little water available already. And over here, looking at this marum grass under the microscope, it demonstrates some of those adaptations really well. So the leaves aren't actually flat, they roll up and we have stomata which are really deep and sunken in and we have lots of tiny hairs sticking out. Now, all of those adaptations are to reduce water loss because any water that is evaporating out is going to get trapped on these hairs and the fact it's curled in, it gets trapped in this space. So it makes this area very, very humid. And if it's very humid, that will reduce further evaporation. Now, in addition to that, they also have a thicker cuticle to reduce water loss. And we can't see it on this particular image, but they do have a longer root network to be able to reach further distances to try and find any available water. Now, haemoglobin is involved in the mass transport of oxygen around the body. And it's an example of a quaternary structure protein because it's made up of four polypeptide chains. You also have a range of different types of haemoglobins. One that we'll be looking at is myoglobin, which is found in the muscle tissue in vertebrates and also in fetuses. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is a way to look at how haemoglobin behaves in different conditions. Oxygen is loaded in regions with a high partial pressure of oxygen. So what that means is when haemoglobin is in areas with a lot of oxygen available, such as the alveoli, it will be able to pick up lots of oxygen. In regions with a low partial pressure of oxygen, for example, respiring tissues, haemoglobin unloads the oxygen. And that is how we get the shape of this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. We can see at the different partial pressures, how saturated haemoglobin is with oxygen. And the more saturated it is, that means it must have loaded up with more oxygen. The less saturated it is, it must have unloaded oxygen and that's why it's not holding very much anymore. So we can see here we've got our respiring tissues compared to the alveoli. Now this graph also demonstrates cooperative binding. And this cooperative nature of oxygen binding to haemoglobin is due to the haemoglobin changing shape when the first oxygen binds. It then makes it easier for the subsequent oxygens to bind. Now you can also see dissociation curves to demonstrate the Bohr effect. And the Bohr effect is when high carbon dioxide concentration or partial pressure causes the oxyhemoglobin curve to shift to the right. The affinity for oxygen decreases, and that is because the acidic carbon dioxide changes the shape of the haemoglobin slightly. 
and therefore it means the haemoglobin behaves differently and it's more likely to unload the haemoglobin even at the same partial pressures. So we can see here we've got three curves at different pHs and the lower the pH, the more carbon dioxide there would be present. So we can see here at pH 7.6 compared to let's say 7.2, the curve has shifted to the right and even at the same partial pressure, so we'll pick 20, we can see that the saturation is only about 25%, but for this one, it's just under 60%. And that is because of this Bohr effect. So low partial pressure of carbon dioxide would typically be in the alveoli because you are exhaling that carbon dioxide. A high partial pressure of carbon dioxide would be at respiring tissues because carbon dioxide is produced in respiration. Now that would be an advantage because it means that haemoglobin will behave differently, it will unload oxygen more readily and therefore it's unloading the oxygen at the respiring tissues. Now different animals have haemoglobin adapted to their particular needs and environments also. And that is one thing that you could get application questions on. So a fetus, and this is a human fetus, they will have myoglobin or fetal haemoglobin. And the fetal haemoglobin has an even higher affinity for oxygen, even at the same partial pressures compared to adult haemoglobin. And that's an advantage because it means that as the blood is circulating through the umbilical cord, the fetus's haemoglobin is able to load the oxygen off of the mother's adult haemoglobin. Llamas are found at high altitudes where we have very, very low partial pressures of oxygen. So for the llama, we can see that they also have haemoglobin that has a higher affinity for oxygen, even at lower partial pressures. So we can see that would mean that if there isn't very much oxygen available, which there wouldn't be at a high altitude, then the haemoglobin is still able to load up. Animals like doves, for example, their needs are that they need more oxygen to match their faster metabolism because they're flying so much and need oxygen for the muscle contraction. So the haemoglobin of a dove, the curve actually is shifted to the right compared to human haemoglobin. And that means that the haemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen and therefore it will more readily unload the oxygen which is needed for respiration. Earthworms are a different example. So they will be underground a lot where there's very low partial pressures of oxygen. So they have haemoglobin that has very high affinities even at low partial pressures so that their haemoglobin can load up with whatever oxygen is available. In mammals, the circulatory system is described as closed and double. Closed meaning that the blood remains within the blood vessels the entire time, and double referring to the fact that the blood passes through the heart twice in each circuit. So there is one circuit that delivers blood from the heart to the lungs, and the other circuit delivers the blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Mammals require to have a double circulatory system to manage the pressure of blood flow. The blood flows through the lungs at a lower pressure, and this is to prevent damage to the capillaries in the alveoli, but it also means that the blood will flow at a slower speed, so there is more time for gas exchange. The oxygenated blood from the lungs then goes back to the heart, and it's pumped out at a higher pressure to the rest of the body. And this is important to make sure that the blood is able to reach all of those respiring cells in the body. Now, the key blood vessels that you need to know about are, first of all, the coronary arteries. And these are the arteries that cover the heart itself to supply the heart muscle or cardiac muscle with oxygenated blood. You also need to know the four blood vessels that are delivering blood into and out of the heart the vena cava, aorta, pulmonary artery, and the pulmonary vein. You need to know the blood vessels that deliver blood to the lungs and carry it away. So the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. So anytime that you see pulmonary, that is referring to the lungs. And you can see here that the pulmonary artery is carrying blood away from the heart to the lungs. The lungs will then oxygenate the blood and the pulmonary vein is delivering that blood back into the heart.
The kidneys, we have the renal artery and the renal vein. So where you see the word renal, that is referring to a blood vessel attached to the kidneys. Those major blood vessels are connected within this double circulatory system via arteries, arterioles, capillaries and veins. The cardiac muscle has a range of special features. Now the walls of the heart have a very, very thick muscular layer so that it can contract with high force to deliver high pressure blood to all of the body cells. Now the unique properties that the cardiac muscle has is first of all, it's myogenic. And that means it can contract and relax without nervous or hormonal stimulation. It also never fatigues. So as long as it has a constant supply of oxygen and glucose, it will be able to respire aerobically. The coronary arteries we can see here, they are what supply the cardiac muscle with this oxygen and glucose so that it never fatigues. They branch off from the aorta, which we can see here. And if one of those coronary arteries was to become blocked, that would then mean that the heart muscle or the cardiac muscle wouldn't be receiving the oxygen or glucose. Therefore, the cardiac muscle wouldn't be able to respire and it would stop contracting. And that would cause a myocardial infarction or in other words, a heart attack. So you need to know some of the key structures of the heart. First of all, there are four chambers. We have two atria at the top and we have the two ventricles at the bottom. The atria have thinner muscular walls, and that's because they don't need to contract with as much force because they're only delivering the blood from the atria into the ventricles. They also have elastic walls so that they can stretch when the blood is entering. The ventricles have much thicker muscular walls, and that is so they can contract with more force and pump the blood out at higher pressure because they are carrying the blood for distances either to the lungs or to the rest of the body. Now the right ventricle is pumping the blood to the lungs and that is at a lower pressure, as we said, to prevent damage to the capillaries and go at a slower speed. So comparatively, the right ventricle wall has a thinner muscular layer. The left ventricle has a much thicker muscular layer in its wall because it has to contract with more force to pump the blood at high pressure around the body. Highlighted here, we have the four key blood vessels. We've got the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, the vena cava and the pulmonary veins. But for some of them, there's actually multiple. So we can see we have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. We also have the pulmonary artery, which is carrying the blood away from the heart to the lungs, but we have one coming out of the left and one out of the right. Same with the pulmonary veins, which is carrying blood into the left atrium from the lungs. We have one on the left side, one on the right side. And the reason for both of those is we have a right lung and a left lung. The aorta is carrying blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Now, some of the ways just to try and remember what each of these are doing are, first of all, if you see veins, veins are carrying blood into the heart. And vena cava means vein and cava means body. So that is carrying the deoxygenated blood from the body into the right atrium. Pulmonary, we said, means lungs. And again, it's a vein. So it's carrying oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium. Arteries, think A away, it's carrying blood away from the heart. So pulmonary artery is carrying deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. And the aorta is the major artery, which is carrying oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Now, the valves that you need to know about are the semilunar valves, which are in the aorta and the pulmonary artery, as well as the atrioventricular valves, which are between the atria and the ventricles. Sometimes you'll see those called the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves. And we can see these labelled here on the diagram of the heart. Now, valves are to prevent the backflow of blood. And they do this by only opening when the pressure is higher behind the valve compared to in front. So if the pressure is higher in front, it causes the valve to shut. And that is how it stops the blood from flowing backwards. The septum is running through the middle of the heart to separate the blood on the deoxygenated and the oxygenated side 
and that's to help to maintain a high concentration of oxygen in the oxygenated blood to make sure that these diffusion gradients are maintained so that diffusion can occur at respiring cells. Looking at the blood vessels that are connecting all of the major blood vessels together, we have the arteries, arterioles, capillaries and veins. Arteries, as we said, think A away, they carry blood away from the heart towards the arterioles. The arterioles are smaller than arteries and connect to the capillaries. The capillaries connect the arterioles to the veins and the veins will then carry blood back into the heart. So we can see here our arteries connected to our arterioles. We then have this capillary bed or network of capillaries connecting to the venules and then the vein. So the structures of the arteries and vein are quite different because of the fact that one is carrying blood away from the heart and one's carrying it into, so the pressure of the blood they're carrying will vary. So arteries have a much thicker muscular layer compared to the veins. And that is so that constriction and dilation can occur to control the volume of blood flowing through them. They also have a thicker elastic layer than the veins, and that's to help maintain the blood pressure. So the walls can actually stretch and recoil in response to the heartbeat. So overall, the thickness of the wall is thicker because of those two thick layers, but also it stops the blood vessels from bursting at that high pressure. So we can see here how thick those walls are. They also don't have any valves. So in comparison, veins have a much thinner muscular layer, thinner elastic layer and thinner walls in general. And that is because the blood is at lower pressure, so they're not at risk of bursting. However, because the blood is at lower pressure, they do require valves to help prevent the backflow of the blood um, to make sure that the blood is going to be pumped back into the heart. The capillaries are very, very narrow in diameter. And this is to make sure that the blood speed is going to slow right down as it's passing through the capillaries. And that is to allow time for gas exchange and tissue fluid formation in the capillaries. So we've already talked about the arteries and the veins. But if we now add in the arterioles and capillaries, the arterioles are thicker than in the arteries, the muscular layer. And that is to help restrict the blood flow to the capillaries. The elastic layer is thinner than the arteries, and that is because the pressure is now slightly lower. And overall, the wall is thinner compared to the arteries because the pressure is slightly lower, but they still don't have valves. Capillaries do not have any muscular or elastic tissue layer. They are only one cell thick, and that is to make sure there's a really short diffusion distance because the function of the capillaries is that is where exchange of materials between the blood and the cells occur. The cardiac cycle is split into three stages. Now people pronounce this differently, so I'm going to say both diastole or distole, atrial systole or atrial systole, and ventricular systole or systole. And we're going to go through what happens at each stage. So in diastole, the atria and ventricle muscles are relaxed. And this is when blood will enter the atria through the vena cava and the pulmonary vein. And the blood flowing into the atria then causes an increase in the pressure because we've now got a larger volume of liquid there. Then we get atrial systole occurring. And that is when the atria muscles contract and that increases the pressure even more in the atria. And because we now have this high pressure, that causes the atrioventricular valves to open, and blood moves from the atria into the ventricles. And at this stage, the ventricle muscles are relaxed. We have ventricular diastole. The last stage then we have is ventricular systole which is when the ventricle muscles contract and that happens after a short delay and it will increase the pressure beyond that of the atria which causes these atrioventricular valves to shut but when they've contracted high enough to increase the pressure above that of the atria and pulmonary artery the semilunar valves will open 
and that causes blood to be pumped out of those two blood vessels. You could be asked to calculate the cardiac output and that is the volume of blood which leaves one ventricle in one minute and it can be calculated by doing the heart rate times the stroke volume and the heart rate is beats of the heart in one minute. Stroke volume is the volume of blood that leaves the heart each beat and that is in decimeters cubed. Tissue fluid is a fluid that contains water, glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions and oxygen and it's the liquid that is forced out of the capillaries to bathe the cells to make sure the cells are getting all of the uh, minerals, nutrients that they require from the blood. Now it's formed due to the fact that capillaries have very, very small gaps between each of the cells that make up the capillary walls. And as the blood enters the capillaries from the arterioles, the smaller diameter results in a very, very high hydrostatic pressure of the blood. And because we have this high hydrostatic pressure and tiny gaps between the cells that make up the capillary walls, water and small molecules are forced out. So glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions, oxygen are all forced out of the capillary to the surrounding cells. And that is called ultra filtration. So the molecules that can be forced out, we just went through all of those, but anything that is too big cannot get out of those tiny gaps between the capillary cells. And that would be things like the red blood cells, platelets and large proteins. So those will remain in the blood. And the fact that they remain in the blood is actually what enables the liquid from the tissue fluid to be reabsorbed again. So towards the venule end of the capillary, which is over here, the hydrostatic pressure has decreased. And that's because so much liquid has been forced out, the pressure within the capillary has now dropped by the time we've got to the venule end of the capillary. However, we don't have as much liquid, but we have lots of those large proteins that have remained behind, which has lowered the water potential of the blood in the capillary compared to the water potential in the liquid surrounding the cells, which is the tissue fluid. And as a result, that liquid is going to, or the water is going to re-enter by osmosis and it will carry with it waste that has dissolved in that tissue fluid that was released from the cells. So things like carbon dioxide and urea. So that gets absorbed into the capillaries by osmosis and then it'll be transported around the body to be removed as waste. Now, not all of the liquid will be reabsorbed by osmosis because eventually equilibrium will be reached and the water potential inside of the capillary and of the tissue fluid will be the same. So any of that water that doesn't get reabsorbed by osmosis will enter the lymphatic system instead. And then when we have it transported around the um, lymphatic system, it will eventually get to one of the lymph vessels near the heart where that liquid is drained into the blood again. And that is how we don't run out of liquid in the blood. So the last bit of topic three is mass transport in plants. And we start with the mass transport of water looking at, first of all, transpiration. So transpiration is the loss of water vapour from the stomata. So water evaporates out of stomata on the leaves. And there are four key factors that affect the rate of transpiration. First of all, light intensity. The more light there is present, the more stomata will open, and therefore there's a larger surface area for evaporation. If it's hotter, that means that the water molecules will have more kinetic energy and therefore they'll be moving faster and evaporate at a faster rate. With humidity, the more water vapour that is in the air, that will actually make the water potential more positive outside of the leaf and it reduces the water potential gradient. So what that means is the more humid it is, the less transpiration there will be occurring. With wind, because the wind is carrying away air that contains water vapour, the wind will actually be maintaining the water potential gradient. So the more windy it is, the faster the rate of transpiration. So how water actually moves from the roots 
all the way up the xylem to transpire out of the stomata links to this idea of the cohesion tension theory. So water has to move up the plant from the roots against gravity and that can be a very very large distance if it's a huge tree and this is possible because of the cohesion, the capillarity or adhesion and root pressure. So if we look at cohesion first, this links to the theory of water. Water is dipolar, meaning we've got two slight charges, two different charges, a slight negative on the oxygen and a slight positive on the hydrogen atoms. And that means hydrogen bonds can form between the hydrogen and oxygen of different water molecules. And it creates this cohesion or sticking together of the water molecules. Now that's an advantage because as the water moves up the xylem, that means it's all bonded together with these hydrogen bonds and it moves up as a continuous column of water and it's much easier to pull up a column than it is individual water molecules. The next idea was this idea of adhesion whereby the water molecules will actually also stick to the walls of the xylem and if you have a really narrow xylem that will increase this capillarity effect and therefore the liquid will be moving up more just from this sticking, this adhesion effect. So the narrower the xylem, the easier it's going to be to transport the liquid up the xylem against gravity. Root pressure is the final concept and this is as the water moves into the roots by osmosis, it increases the volume of liquid inside the roots and therefore the pressure inside the root increases as well. And we call that root pressure. And that creates this positive pressure, which means it's a pushing force. Because we have lots of water in the roots, it pushes all of the water above it upwards. So it helps push the water up the xylem. So those three concepts all work together for the cohesion tension theory. And that's how water moves up against gravity. So just have a look at this at a whole. The first thing that happens is the water evaporates out of the stomata and as that water vapour is leaving, that is then leaving behind this lower pressure because liquid has been lost. And that creates this negative pressure or in other words, a pulling force. And that pulls the water column up the xylem. And because of cohesion, we have that water column whereby all the water molecules are stuck together. The water molecules are also adhering or sticking to the walls of the xylem to help pull the column upwards. And as the column of water is pulling up, it also creates tension in the xylem, which actually pulls the xylem inwards, making it narrower, which increases that impact of the capillarity or the adhesion, and it helps to move the water up even more. Now, the second type of mass transport in plants is looking at how the organic molecules like glucose produced in photosynthesis are transported around. And this now happens in the phloem. Now, the phloem tissue contains two key cells. We have the sieve tube elements and the companion cells. And the sieve tube elements, which are here, are living cells, but they don't contain any nuclei, and they're very few organelles. And that is so it's pretty much hollow to make it easy for the solutions to transport through the tube. The companion cells are on the outside, and they provide the ATP required for active transport of the organic substances. So they have all the organelles that the sieve tube elements don't, so they can provide the resources needed. Now the transport of these organic molecules within solution is often explained using this source to sink model. So we have here the xylem next to the phloem and the source in this model would be a photosynthesizing cell. The sink which is where the sugars are going to be delivered is a respiring cell. So at the source we have photosynthesizing cells and the sucrose or glucose that would be made in photosynthesis is going to lower the water potential of those cells and therefore any surrounding water in the plant or from the xylem is going to be entering those cells by osmosis. At the other end where we have our respiring sink cells because they'll be using up those sugars in respiration 
there will be a more positive water potential inside of the cell compared to outside. And therefore, water is going to leave the respiring cells by osmosis to other cells in the plant or even the xylem. So the effect that has is there'll be an increase in the hydrostatic pressure in the source cell, but a decrease in the sink cell. And because of those pressure changes, the liquids that are within that source cell will be forced by that high hydrostatic pressure through the xylem all the way to the sink cell. Now, that is part of the story, but also you need to know the translocation steps. So how those sugars within the leaf cell actually make it into the phloem for that pressure then to actually move the liquid along. So photosynthesis is occurring in the chloroplasts, in the leaves, and we're calling those the source cells. That, we said, creates a high concentration of sucrose. Now, as well as that affecting the water potential, that also means that the sucrose can diffuse down its concentration gradient into the companion cell by facilitated diffusion. We then get active transport of protons or hydrogen ions from the companion cell into the space within the cell walls and that uses energy because it's active transport. Now that creates a concentration gradient and therefore the protons move down their gradient via carrier proteins into the sieve tube elements. And the co-transport of sucrose with those hydrogen ions occurs via a protein co-transporter and that is how the sucrose goes from being in the companion cell into the phloem even though there is a high concentration often of sugar or sucrose in the phloem already. So the next step then is we're looking at the movement of that sucrose within the phloem sieve tube element. So the increase of sucrose in the sieve tube element is going to lower that water potential and therefore water enters those sieve tube elements from the xylem vessels which are tightly compacted next to the phloem. The increase in water volume in the sieve tube element at this position will increase the hydrostatic pressure and this is where we have the idea of source to sink. It causes the liquid to be forced from the source area down to the sink cells. Lastly, the sucrose is then used in respiration at the sink or it might be stored away as starch if it's not currently required. But that means more sucrose is actively transported into the sink cells and that is going to cause the water potential to decrease. And as a result, um, we'll have water moving by osmosis from the sieve tube elements into the sink cell. Some water will also be returning from the sieve tube element into the xylem. The removal of that water is decreasing the volume in the sieve tube element and therefore the hydrostatic pressure decreases. So the movement of soluble organic substances is due to the difference in the hydrostatic pressure between the source and the sink end of the sieve tube element. Now you could be asked about two particular investigations that prove translocation. The first one is called traces, and this is where we have tracing involving radioactively labeling carbon. Plants are provided with only radioactively labelled carbon dioxide and over time they'll be absorbing that in through the stomata, using it in photosynthesis and the organic substances like the sugars created will all contain that radioactively labelled carbon. Thin slices from the stems are then cut and placed on x-ray film that will turn black when exposed to radioactive material. When the stems are placed on the x-ray film, the section of the stem containing the sugars turn black and this highlights where the phloem are and it can show the sugars are transported in the phloem and it also means you can track the route that is taken. Ringing experiments is when a ring of bark and phloem are peeled and removed off the trunk, like we can see here. The result of removing the phloem is that the trunk swells above the removed section. And analysis of the liquid in this swelling shows it contains sugar. So this shows that when the phloem is removed, 
The sugars cannot be transported and it therefore proves the flow and transports sugars. Carbohydrates is the first biological molecule that you need to know. And I've got an overview here of the three levels of size of the molecules you need to know. So monosaccharide, mono means one, so one sugar unit. Disaccharide, di is two, so that's when you have two sugar units joined together. And the polysaccharides is when you have many joined together. And for each of those carbohydrates, there are three examples that you need to know. Glucose, fructose, and galactose are the three monosaccharides that you need to know. The disaccharides are sucrose, maltose, and lactose, and the polysaccharides, starch, cellulose, and glycogen. Now for the monosaccharides, the main thing you need to know is the structure of alpha and beta glucose. So alpha glucose, we can see here, this is the level of detail that you'd be expected to draw this for AQA biology. And you would also need to know the formula, so C6H12O6. Now I did say you need to know alpha and beta, and that's because glucose comes as two isomers, which is when you have the same molecular formula, but there is a different structure. And the key differences I'll just highlight here. So for alpha glucose, on the carbon one, which is the carbon that would be in this position, you have the hydrogen atom on top and the hydroxyl group on the bottom. For beta glucose, the only difference is those swap around. So the hydroxyl group's on top and the hydrogen atom is on the bottom. The disaccharides then, it's made up of two monosaccharides. When those are joined together, the chemical bond that forms is a glycosidic bond and they are created via a condensation reaction. Now I did name the three that you need to know, but in addition to that, for those three, you would need to know the word equation and therefore which two monosaccharides they're made from. So maltose is glucose plus glucose, lactose is glucose plus galactose, easier one to remember because there's lactose in the name, and then sucrose is made up of glucose plus fructose. And because all three are condensation reactions, that is why one of the products is water, because water is released. Now for the polysaccharides, you need to know the structure and how that links to the function, as well as some general other facts. So here's a very basic summary. Starch and cellulose are both found in plants, but they have different functions. Starch is a store of glucose, so it can provide chemical energy. Um, and the cellulose is also in plants, but the function is structural strength in the cell wall. Glycogen is the only one found in animals, and this is a store of glucose as well, mainly found in the liver and the muscle cells. So just to summarize everything you need to know about the carbohydrates polymer, which is the polysaccharides, you need to know which monomer they're made of. Now, yes, it is glucose for all three, but which isomer is different? Starch and glycogen are both made from alpha glucose, but cellulose is beta glucose. They're all glycosidic bonds, but they're different types. And the thing that's different about them is the location. And that's what these numbers refer to. So a one to four glycosidic bond means the bond forms between carbon one in one of the molecules and carbon four in another. And those numbers just refer to the position of the carbon in the glucose ring. So starch is made up of one to four and one to six. And amylose, which is one of the polysaccharides of starch, only has one to four, whereas amylopectin has both. Cellulose only has one to four, glycogen also has both. And it's the one to six glycosidic bonds that create a branched structure. The one to four forms polymers in a straight line. The function we've already said on the previous slide, as have we said the location, but a little bit more about the structure then. And this again links to what we were just saying about the bonds. So amylose is an unbranched polymer and it actually coils up to make a helix. And that is really useful because if it coils up, it can then be compacted to fit a lot in a small space. 
Amylopectin is branched and the advantage of that is the branches create a larger surface area so more enzymes can attach to the end and hydrolyze to turn it back into glucose when the plant might need glucose. All three have one feature in common, they're polysaccharides which means they're large and because they are large they're insoluble that means they won't affect the water potential of the cell and therefore no impact on osmosis. Cellulose has got a very different structure and this is because it only contains one to four glycosidic bonds. So the polymer forms long straight chains. Now those chains line up in parallel next to each other and hydrogen bonds join them together. And we call that structure a fibril because there are so many hydrogen bonds holding these chains together, collectively they provide a lot of strength. And that is why cellulose is a very strong molecule. It's the large quantity of hydrogen bonds. Glycogen, now this is actually very similar to starch, in particular the amylopexin in starch. The key difference is it has a higher proportion of one to six glycosidic bonds. And for that reason, it's even more branched and it can be even more readily hydrolyzed back into glucose. And that's an advantage because we find in animals and because animals move, they will need more glucose. We then move on to how variation is introduced and gene mutations is one way. A change in the base sequence of DNA is what a gene mutation is. And they randomly occur during DNA replication. So within the interphase part of the cell cycle. These random mutations are more likely to occur if you're exposed to mutagenic agents, which can interfere with the DNA replication. That includes high energy radiation like UV light, ionizing radiation like gamma rays and X-rays, and also some chemicals which we call carcinogens, for example, mustard gas and cigarette smoke. A gene mutation can result in either a base being deleted or swapped, so substituted for a different base. So here are our examples. We have our original DNA sequence. This is showing a substitution. So instead of cytosine, that has been swapped or substituted for adenine. This one is showing a deletion because that base C has now been deleted. And that's actually caused what we call a frame shift. Everything downstream of the mutation has shifted to the left. A base mutation, though, might have no impact at all because the new codon may still code for the same amino acid, and that's because the genetic code is degenerate. Chromosome mutations can also occur, and chromosome mutations are changes in the number of chromosomes, and this spontaneously occurs during meiosis in a process called non-disjunction. So non-disjunction is when the chromosomes, or it could be the chromatids, do not equally split during anaphase of either meiosis 1 or meiosis 2. So that's what we can see here, non-disjunction occurring because the chromatids didn't separate and instead all of them are being pulled to the same pole of the cell. Now this can occur in two forms either a change in the whole set of chromosomes, which we call polyploidy, or changes in the number of individual chromosomes, which is aneuploidy. So we'll go through polyploidy first, which we said is a change in the whole sets of chromosomes. So you could end up, instead of being diploid, having two copies of every chromosome, which we have in humans, you could have three copies or four copies of every chromosome which would be called triploid or tetraploid. Now in humans, that would be fatal. You don't see triploid or tetraploid humans, but it's actually quite common in plants. So how this would occur then, each homologous pair is doubled in replication, and that happens in interphase. In this example, we have non-disjunction in meiosis one. For some reason, the spindle fibers haven't attached to the chromosome on this side, and they have attached to all of the chromosomes on the other side. So when the spindle fibers retract, it's going to pull all of the chromosomes to one side of the cell, and therefore they're all going to be in this cell and there'll be no chromosomes in the next one. In meiosis two, that would mean that 
these two gametes will contain no chromosomes at all. So those gametes will not function. These gametes though, meiosis II is happening normally and we do have complete separation of all of the chromatids, but we now have two copies of every chromosome in the gamete. So instead of having a haploid gamete, we have a diploid gamete. And if a diploid gamete fuses with a haploid gamete, that is how we then end up with three copies. So we get two chromosomes from this gamete instead of one, and we get just one chromosome from the haploid gamete. So that is polyploidy, changes in the whole sets of chromosomes. That could also happen if you have non-disjunction in meiosis II. In this example, we can see the chromosomes in meiosis I did separate equally. And then we had normal meiosis II in this example, so we have two haploid gametes. But for this cell, in meiosis II, there was non-disjunction. So the spindle fibers didn't form on this side. So the chromatids aren't separated equally and instead they're all pulled to this cell. So again, we end up with a 2N gamete, a diploid gamete, and this gamete has no chromosomes in. Aneuploidy, this is different. This is when you have changes in the number of individual chromosomes. So sometimes individual homologous pairs of chromosomes fail to separate during meiosis. It's still called non-disjunction, but instead of it being affecting every single chromosome or chromatid, it's just one. And this is how Down syndrome occurs. You have non-disjunction on chromosome 21, so you end up with three copies of that chromosome instead of two. So let's see how that might occur. We can see in this one, we have non-disjunction occurring at meiosis one because these spindle fibers for just that one chromosome or that one homologous pair of chromosomes is attaching and it pulls them both to this cell. And this cell does not get a copy of that red chromosome. If meiosis two occurs normally, so no non-disjunction, all of the chromatids are separated equally. However, because of the non-disjunction of meiosis one, this gamete is haploid. It has one copy of all the chromosomes except for the red. So we describe that as haploid plus one extra chromosome. So N plus one. These two are still haploid, but they're missing a chromosome. So we describe it as N for haploid minus one. Now if an N plus one, so a haploid with an additional chromosome, is to fuse with a haploid chromosome, that is how you can get trisomy, which means three copies. So tri, trisomy is three, three copies of one particular chromosome. And that is how Down syndrome occurs, three copies of chromosome 21. Now you could also have non-disjunction occurring in meiosis two. So we can see the normal cell division occurred in the first round of meiosis, but now we have non-disjunction in meiosis two because the chromatids are not separated equally for the red chromosome. They're all pulled to this one gamete, so that would be N plus one. And this one is missing the red chromosome, so it's N minus one. Now, another way that variation can be introduced is in meiosis. And meiosis creates gametes and it creates four genetically different haploid gametes by two nuclear divisions. So meiosis is how variation can be introduced as well, and that's through two mechanisms, independent segregation of homologous chromosomes and crossing over between homologous chromosomes. And both of these occur within the first round of division in meiosis. Independent segregation is when the homologous pairs of chromosomes line up opposite each other at the equator to form bivalence. It is random which side of the equator the paternal and maternal chromosomes from each homologous pair align. So we can see on this side by chance two purples, two reds, but equally it could have been a purple and a red, a red and a purple. In meiosis, those homologous pairs of chromosomes are separated in meiosis one, so one of each homologous pair ends up in the daughter cells eventually. 
This creates a large number of possible combinations of chromosomes in the daughter cells produced. And you can actually calculate this by doing two to the power of n. Two, because it is homologous pairs, so you have pairs of chromosomes. And n, you would substitute in for how many homologous pairs of chromosomes that species has. So for humans, that would be two to the power of 23. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, which means we can make over 8 million different possible gametes just from independent segregation. Now, crossing over also occurs sometimes. It's actually quite rare, but it can occur. And again, it occurs when the homologous pairs of chromosomes line up at the equator and form a bivalent, which is what we call it when you have both of them next to each other. And you have chromatids from each of those chromosomes cross over and they can get twisted around each other. That puts tension on the chromatids, causing part of the chromatid to break and swap. And in doing that, we create new combinations of alleles, which is represented by the letters here. So originally, this chromosome only had a dominant allele, but now we've got a dominant and recessive, so one that's pulled apart, we've got new combinations of alleles on that chromosome. Now, comparing meiosis and mitosis, meiosis is two nuclear divisions, whereas mitosis is only one. That's why meiosis results in haploid cells, whereas mitosis is diploid cells. Meiosis introduces genetic variation through crossing over and independent segregation. Mitosis creates genetically identical cells. Now, you could be asked to identify meiosis in an unfamiliar life cycle. And what you need to do here is look for where you have cells that were diploid or 2N dividing to then create cells that are haploid because that's what happens in meiosis. You go from 2N to N. It won't always be gametes because not all organisms have life cycles like humans where it is the creation of the gametes that is meiosis. So for example, we can see here we have the zygote, which is 2N, and then it makes something called zoospores, which are N. So that would be the meiosis stage. So that's what you're looking for, 2N moving to N. So again, that bit there would be meiosis. Next, then it's thinking about species and taxonomy. So a species is when two organisms are able to produce fertile offspring. And a species must reproduce and pass on advantageous alleles in order for the whole species to be able to survive. And this is where courtship behaviour comes in. This behaviour is essential for successful mating, meaning mating and creating fertile offspring, in order for species to survive. So courtship behaviour is a sequence of actions which is unique to every species. So it is genetically coded for this behaviour and it is how animals are able to identify members of their own species to make sure they are reproducing with members of their own species to make sure that they can create fertile offspring. The behaviour, the sequence of actions is normally carried out by the male and then the female picks whether they are worthy of mating with. Now this sequence could include dance moves, creation of sounds, release of pheromones, display of feathers, fighting, whatever it is, it's always a unique sequence to that species. The female then observes the ritual and decides if they look like they have um, a good enough set of alleles based on their fitness, their performance to mate with. So the reason this is important is, we said, to ensure successful reproduction. And the way it does that is, first of all, because the behaviour is unique to every species, it allows them to recognise members of their own species and also the opposite sex. That is because to make fertile offspring, you'd need um, sperm and egg to fuse. It also synchronizes mating behavior. And what this means is it makes sure that the male and the female are mating when they are sexually mature. So the female is releasing eggs and the male is able to produce and release sperm. It can actually also help the survival of the offspring once it's born in some animals. And that's because this behaviour, this courtship ritual, 
can help form a really strong bond, which we call a pair bond between the parents. So they're more likely to stay together. And if they are together for some animals like penguins, it increases their likelihood of survival because you need one penguin to look after the chick, one penguin to go and find food. It also enables that strong and healthy mates are selected for and therefore the advantageous alleles are being passed on to the next generations to ensure the survival of the entire species. So this could be used as a way for us to identify how closely related different species are as well. So for example, we've been shown three ducks here and the sequence of their courtship behaviour. And we can see that ducks one and two must be more closely related because their sequence of behaviours in the courtship ritual are more similar than duck one and three or ducks two and three. And because this behaviour is genetically coded for, because the sequence of behaviours is more similar, their DNA base sequence is likely to be more similar too. Phylogenetic classification is another way to look at how closely related different species are and also how recent their shared common ancestors were. Phylogenetic classification is arranging groups according to evolutionary origins and relationships. So humans and chimpanzees we can see are most closely related to each other because they branch in the tree most recently compared to the others. So that means they evolved from a shared common ancestor more recently than they did compared to any of the other species. So that means they have had less time to accumulate different mutations in the human and chimpanzee populations compared to, let's say, the human and the horse population because humans and horses, their recent common ancestor is back here. And there's no time scale on this, but this is normally going back, like this would probably be at the very start here. This could be looking at maybe 13, 20 million years ago and so on. So it's millions of years of accumulating mutations in these separate species. Now, you can also classify and group using a hierarchy. And a hierarchy is when you have smaller groups arranged within larger groups and there's no overlap between those groups. So this is one particular hierarchy you need to know off by heart. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And we can see here that within one genus, you can have multiple different species. So that is our smaller groups within larger groups. But there's no overlap in those species. They're still distinct groups. The binomial system is a universal way of identifying organisms. And it's using two names. That's what binomial means. The first name is the genus and the second name is the species. So for humans, our genus is Homo and our species is Sapiens. So our binomial name is Homo sapiens. And we can see an example here of common names, which would be unique to every language, versus the binomial system, which is universally used. Um, that gives you more information on how closely related they are, because calling them both robins is misleading, that they are closely related. But actually, we can see they're not the same species and they're not even the same genus. Genetic diversity within or between species can also be measured by comparing different factors. So you can compare observable characteristics, but that can actually be quite inaccurate because members of different species that aren't even closely related might look similar because they live in similar environments. So more accurate ways to compare how closely related species are is through comparing the DNA base sequence, the mRNA base sequence or the amino acid sequence for proteins. And the more similar those sequences, the more closely related they must be. So that is it for topic four. I hope you found it helpful. And if you have, please give this video a thumbs up.